Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland is a member of the January 6th committee, and he joins me now. Congressman, it's good to have you. First of all, are you following uh, this trial at all? Is the committee following? Very closely. Um, I I'm wondering if anything there is a surprise to you. Obviously, the si January 6th committee and federal law enforcement have different tools at their disposal, different investigative methods. They can, for instance, in the case of the FBI, the Department of Justice, have cooperators who will then give them things. Um, are you learning from the trial? Well, we're learning that Stuart Rhodes' only defense, which is that he anticipated the Insurrection Act being invoked by the former president, has already collapsed. Uh, they've already put on evidence demonstrating that he saw that as legal cover for what he was going to do regardless. Uh, he, he anticipated it being a far bloodier exercise without uh, the thin veneer of this presidential order. But the whole thing is absurd to begin with, because he's saying it's like someone being charged with murder saying, well, I thought I was going to be deputized by the sheriff, but I wasn't. So in other words, I had no legal authority, but right. I thought I was going to have legal authority. Uh, that, that doesn't help you. In any event, uh, the president doesn't have the authority to just turn the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers or any other private militia into an official state militia. Those are organized by the states. The Constitution says the officers are appointed by the state governments and they exist under the discipline created by Congress. So that none of it makes any sense. And uh, I assume that, that this Yale Law School graduate understands it makes no sense, but he thought that he would kind of throw some uh, legal smoke screens up over what was clearly dangerous insurrectionary activity. This is what a violent insurrection looks like. There's an interesting question about prosecuting insurrections, and there have been failed prosecutions in the past, I think for two reasons, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this as, as someone who's investigating this scheme from a different perspective and also as a constitutional law scholar. One is, if you're prosecuting insurrection, it means it's failed. <laughs> If it's successful, you're, you're not, they're not in court. <laughs> they're running the government. So by definition, the insurrection has failed if it's being prosecuted. And number two, the First Amendment we take seriously. We take seriously that people can assemble and they can speech and they can speak and they can think terrible things like, the, you know, uh, Donald Trump should use violence to stay in office. You have to actually act. How hard is that threshold, do you think? And, and, and is that part of what you're looking at in this trial here? Well, <clears throat> I, I think you need the mens rea, the intent, um, and clear, clearly there was intent. It is all over these uh, online communications they were having. And then you need forward motion and the actual taking up of arms against the government um, and the, the engagement in violence. And I think we saw that as well. Um, you know, we don't have to wait for an insurrection to succeed in order to treat it as an insurrection. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 of the Constitution says Congress has the power to call forth the militias of the states in order to do three things, enforce the laws, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions mm. uh, of the United States. So it's one of the major purposes for calling forth militias, not in order to conduct insurrections, right. but in order to suppress them. And there are more than a half a dozen different mentions in the Constitution of the power of the federal government to put down insurrections and domestic violence. I want to read to you from uh, some, some reporting in The Washington Post about Roger Stone. Uh, and this is a Stuart Rhodes message to him on November 7th, 2020. And I read it here. On the day the News Network declared Joe Biden the winner of the 2020 election, Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes sent a message to a group chat that included longtime Trump confidant Roger Stone. Uh, this is the Friends of Stone. What's the plan? We need to roll. I'm on my way to D.C. right now with my Oath Keepers tactical leaders for a possible D.C. op to do a leader's recon and make plans. I'm available to meet face to face. So you've got the Friends of Stone is where a lot of this is being organized. Do you think we know the full scope of Roger Stone's involvement in January 6th? Uh, no, but we know a little bit more uh, with every trial and with every bit of investigative evidence that is surfacing. I mean, the way to think about, Trump, uh, about Stone is there were three people who were pardoned uh, by, the pre by the then president, um, Stone, uh, Michael Flynn, uh, and Steve Bannon. And all three of them 
acted as intermediaries to a different extent with the underworld of domestic violent extremist mm -hmm. groups. Of course, Roger Stone has made a career out of that, basically being the transmission belt between the highest precincts of power in the Republican Party and then street fascists and hooligans. I mean, that's how he's defined his role. We saw that in 2000 during the, the Gucci riot as well. Um, but uh, and Michael Flynn also has been doing his outreach. So I think I call these guys the Flintstones. Uh, they are really the, the critical point of contact between the Trump uh, campaign to overthrow the 2020 election and the domestic violent extremist groups. I think that uh, Donald Trump was pretty careful not to get his hands dirty with that, except in terms of what he would say in public, such as uh, Proud Boys stand back and stand by. So he made his intent clear at that broad level. It's kind of like when he said to uh, Putin, to Russia, go out and find the emails. Uh, he would do it to that extent, broadcasting his general intent. But in terms of working with them specifically, that was left to subordinates. Yeah, that's interesting. The sort of the kind of off book outsourcing to Stone, who clearly is sort of in the middle of a lot of this. I mean, that's just a documented fact. We saw who was providing him security and, and, and the like. Um, is there anything you can tell us uh, to look for or, or any broad contours of what uh, to expect for the hearing on Thursday? Well, the, you know, the central culpability of Donald Trump is how we began the story. And in some sense, it has to end there. I do hope that we will be able to underscore the continuing clear and present danger that democratic institutions and the right to vote face in America because of this onslaught unleashed by Donald Trump. We've got a majority of GOP candidates across the country who are now election deniers, and that obviously poses a serious threat of electoral destabilization going forward. There are these uh, heightened threats around galvanized domestic violent extremist groups, and then the continuing assaults on people's right to register, people's right to vote, people's right to get their votes counted. So I hope that all of that will become clear so people don't think of this as a discreet and past episode, but a continuing threat to the republic and one that calls upon all of us across all political lines across the country to stand up for democratic institutions. We know that the hallmarks of fascist political parties are a cult of authoritarian personality based on a charismatic figure, a refusal to accept the results of democratic elections when they don't go their way, and then a refusal to disavow political violence or an eagerness to embrace political violence. And all of those factors are very much in the air today.